Have you ever wondered what would happen if you stopped eating bread for 30 days? How would your body react? Would you start to feel better or worse? Let's take a look at some new facts that are sure to surprise you. All information has been tested and analyzed by qualified experts. If you want to become the master of your health, put a like and we'll get started. Next, in order for you, my friends, to get the most out of this video, I suggest that you focus on what I'm going to say rather than what I'm going to show you on the screen. So just listen and do your own thing at the same time. So, today there's white bread, wheat bread, whole wheat bread, sourdough bread, and you've probably heard that some of these types of breads are considered junk food. But you've also heard that some of them are, on the contrary, healthy. So how does all of this actually work? Let's look into this issue in more detail and talk about bread. First of all, bread consists of 80% starch, and starch is a polysaccharide, that is, a lot of sugars. If you take individual glucose molecules and combine them into chains and branch chains, hundreds and thousands of them, you get starch, a polysaccharide. And that's what many people call a complex carbohydrate. They say individual sugars are bad for you and complex carbohydrates are good for you. The problem is that after a few seconds, you start chipping away at the individual glucose molecules and they get into the bloodstream quickly and glucose is the same thing as sugar, which causes insulin to spike. So, not all the starch will be broken down quickly, but the process of increasing blood sugar and insulin levels will start instantly. Therefore, if you give up bread for 30 days, you will see definite benefits in terms of blood sugar levels. You will lower your blood glucose levels. You will lower your A1 Celsius levels, although it takes three to four months on average. But in this case, after 30 days, you will start to see positive effects and some changes in this metric. You'll see a decrease in fasting insulin levels, and based on glucose and insulin, we'll be able to calculate your HOMA ire, which is a measure of your insulin resistance, and you'll probably see that start to decrease as well. Bread isn't the only thing that can do that, but if you are more prone to diabetes and give up bread, you will probably see your blood count start to shift into a healthier range. Many people have problems with gas, so where does it come from? It's produced by bacteria in the digestive tract, but in order for them to produce gas, they need to be fed, and they love all kinds of carbohydrates, not just bread and sugar. Glucose is digested pretty quickly, while complex carbohydrates are slower. So when you eat something, it goes into your stomach first and stays there for a while. Some of the glucose starts to be absorbed already in the stomach, but most of it and all of the complex carbohydrates continue into the small intestine. It takes them many hours to pass through this labyrinth this long, long tube called the small intestine. And the further they travel through the small intestine, the more complex carbohydrates are broken down and the more they are metabolized as glucose. Eventually, all or virtually all of them must be broken down and digested before they reach the large intestine. The large intestine is where most of the bacteria that make up the intestinal floor reside. The large intestine has billions of bacteria per milliliter, while the small intestine has thousands, Thus, by the time food enters the large intestine, it should already be digested. There should be no carbohydrates left in it except fiber, which we cannot break down. When it comes to carbohydrates, you have to make a compromise. Either you raise your blood sugar or you feed the bacteria. If it's simple carbs, they'll digest very early and you won't have time to take a bite to feed the bacteria. So if it's simple carbohydrates, it raises blood glucose levels and if it's complex carbohydrates, it feeds the bacteria. That's why some people have a lot of digestive problems, and they think whole wheat is worse because it takes longer to break down. So it takes longer to move through the digestive tract. A special case that affects many people and causes them serious problems is called SIBO. It is an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. As I said before, the large intestine should have a lot of bacteria in it. But the small intestine has almost none, but if we don't have a very tight, ileocecal valve, some of those bacteria can get back in. And now instead of thousands, there may be tens or hundreds of thousands of bacteria in the small intestine. Now there's a lot of incompletely digested carbohydrates in there that the bacteria can eat, and so they produce a lot of gas. If you do have SIBO, you probably have to give up more than just bread. But for most people, 
if you give up bread for 30 days, you will notice much less abdominal bloating and gas. Many argue that the presence of bread in our diet has been around for thousands of years, as has the fact that humans have existed in our current state of DNA for about a quarter of a million years. Back then, our DNA was the legacy of hunter-gatherers, as much of our life back then was reduced to hunting and gathering food. Regardless of what our ancestors did, our DNA was preserved for the tasks at hand. Although grains were limited in our diet in the past, their use has changed over time. Agriculture began about 10,000 years ago, and we began to actively develop and cultivate it. Looking at this 10,000-year plot on a larger scale, it becomes clear that although agriculture has been around for a long time, the variety of grains remained limited. We grew several types of grains that gradually succeeded each other. Over the millennia we have altered the DNA of these grains, and only in the last 50 years have we started hybridizing and experimenting with them extensively. Modern wheat is the result of more than 25,000 different varieties, and these changes have occurred in just one moment over a gigantic period of 10,000 years. The point of all this is that although grains have been around for a long time, we didn't eat them until we started farming. And even then, these grains were very different from what we eat today, which is essentially an experiment. It only lasted for a moment. Now that we have modern wheat varieties, they are optimized for yield, longevity and resistance to cold, flood, drought, and pests. They have better baking properties, because they have a higher gluten content, which makes bread more elastic and airy. But they were completely unconcerned about how people tolerate these grains and how they affect our health. Just because something is relatively recent doesn't guarantee that it's bad for us, but it's not too reassuring either, because we've known that meat and vegetables have been around for 250, 000, 000, 000 years. Our DNA knows how to fight grains. But the more we change it, the less likely we are to tolerate grains well. I'm sure you'll agree that the main purpose of food is to get nutrients. So, all of these different foods contain nutrients. But plant foods, and especially grains, also contain what are called anti-nutrients. This means that they contain chemical compounds that prevent us from absorbing nutrients from food, one of which is called phytates. Phytates bind very strongly to minerals, and when they bind to a phytate, we can't absorb them. Thus, they block that part of our nutrition. They also contain enzyme inhibitors. It's encoded in your DNA to create enzymes that are specifically designed to break down certain foods. And if we have inhibitors of those enzymes, we can't break down the food or we can't break down the food. It is broken down completely, and this primarily affects protein digestion. Some of these inhibitors are oxalates, tannins, and gluten. We will come back to gluten separately because it is very important. Another anti-nutritional element is lectins, which we will also talk about separately. When it comes to the pros and cons of grains and bread, almost all the attention goes to gluten. But gluten is actually a mixture of hundreds of different proteins that can be divided into two classes, one called glutenins. These are more like filaments and provide elasticity with which to stretch the dough, and the other class is called gliadins which help the dough rise, helping the bread to rise during baking. The type and amount of gliadins and gluten in wheat are unique, so only wheat can be used to make truly doughy bread, and that's why it's so desirable. Now let's talk about celiac disease. Celiac disease is an immunologically mediated disorder that develops in genetically predisposed individuals and is caused by gluten intolerance, leading to inflammation of the mucosa, villus atrophy, which in turn causes malabsorption. Typical manifestations include diarrhea and abdominal discomfort. Now, a lot of people will say, okay, but I don't have celiac disease. I thought wheat was just something that people with celiac disease should avoid and everyone else should eat it as a healthy food. But it's a little bit more than what's called intestinal barrier resistance, meaning it's not a barrier that's turned on or off. It's not a door that you just open or close. It's a gradual transition from 100% optimal barrier to 0% when it's completely leaky and not functioning. If you have gluten disease, which affects about 1% of the population, your intestinal barrier is already in pretty bad shape, and any gluten consumption worsens it. But there's a group called gluten insensitivity that's getting more and more attention because a lot of people are noticing that they feel bad, that they have symptoms, 
even if they don't test positive for celiac disease. What's happening is that these people are essentially going from normal to bad, so whatever your level is, you're jeopardizing it by eating foods that increase intestinal permeability. Therefore, if your condition changes for the better, you may experience symptoms. About 13% of the population report symptoms. So many people stop eating gluten and notice they feel better. But note that this is self-reported, which means that only those people who are paying attention and have severe enough symptoms will actually tell anyone about it. So this number is actually much higher. In my office, we have found that wheat is the number one sensitivity for most people. So what about everyone else? If you have good intestinal barrier resistance, but you eat gluten, you're still going to break it. You're still going to be exposed to it. Maybe not to the point where you have symptoms and notice them, but that's the reason why most people benefit from limiting gluten, whether you notice its effects on you or not. Wheat also contains a whole class of lectins, basically called wheat germ agglutinin. And what is that? It's a very sticky protein that attaches to epithelial cells. Epithelium is a type of cell that forms barriers or surfaces, so the epithelium is on the outside of your skin. But it's the same type of cell that's inside of you. So any type of barrier or surface is usually made up of epithelial cells. And what happens is these sticky proteins attach little carbohydrate tendrils on top of these microvilli. You have big villi that are like little fingers on the inside of the intestine to increase the surface area to absorb objects, but they're on top of each little cell. On top of each little cell are the microvilli, which are also called the brush border, and on top of those are little carbohydrate tendrils, and these wheat germ agglutinins, these lectins. They're very sticky. They cling to them and they won't let go, so now it causes a lot of stress, a lot of inflammation, and they start to break down the brush border. As a result, these lectins are very strongly associated with leaky gut. And when you have a leaky gut, your gut lets in particles that are too large that your immune system reacts to. And now you're more prone to autoimmunity. But that's not the only place that these epithelial surface cells are. They're also inside the blood vessels. And when these agglutinins stick to the blood vessels, they create the same thing. They increase permeability, leakage, and now some of these little oxidized damaged LDL particles that I've talked about in some of these other videos can pass through these gaps and contribute to cardiovascular disease and plaque formation. But that's not all. Lectins also affect the brush border enzymes. So you get enzymes to digest and break down food, and some of those enzymes are cultured, grown in the brush border. But if the lectins attach and disrupt the brush border, they also disrupt your enzymes. And now you can't digest and assimilate food and nutrients. In addition, lectins have been shown to stimulate insulin receptors, which means they push you towards insulin resistance and lipogenesis, which means you produce more fat and store more fat, and can even block leptin, the activity of leptin, which is the satiety hormone. Your fat cells produce leptin to tell your body that it's okay, we don't need any more fat. But if you block leptin, it won't signal and you won't feel satiety, which means you'll keep eating. If you cut back on bread or give up bread for 30 days, you'll reduce phytate, which means you'll be able to absorb minerals better. If you give up bread, you will also give up lectins and gluten, which will improve your permeability. Your leaky gut will improve. This will reduce inflammation in the gut. So you'll improve nutrient absorption overall because your gut will repair and heal and you'll reduce the likelihood of autoimmunity, irritable bowel syndrome, and pretty much every other digestive problem that you have. Most of them will probably improve. It's not the only thing that may be bothering your gut, but it's one of the most important factors. You will also improve the signaling function of leptin and insulin. Thus, you will reduce the propensity or degree of developing type 2 diabetes. You will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. You'll probably lower your blood pressure and by improving leptin signaling, you'll have reduced food cravings and improved satiety. And of course, because of these two factors, you'll probably lose weight. Many people will say that you can't give up bread. It is simply too important. It is a staple food. It has shaped the world. It helped us create civilization as we know it. And it's true that growing grains and farming was absolutely essential to the culture and type of society we have because it allowed people to not spend all their time hunting and gathering. Instead, they could specialize, assigning farming to some people while others could continue to learn. 
becoming teachers, traders, and so on. Grains also helped feed the masses, which led to the huge number of people living on our planet today. But that doesn't mean we are stuck in this model because we have a new world. Population growth is slowing down. In the next couple decades, we're going to have more technology, more resources, more know-how than ever before. So if we want to, we can create smaller, more sustainable farms that don't just rely on grains. We can grow different crops and go back to some of the ancient grain crops that don't have all these negative side effects. But then you ask, wouldn't that be more expensive? And yes, every time you improve the quality, the cost probably goes up a little bit. But not as much as most people think if we can develop systems and scale them and so on. You have to think about whether you're spending money on quality food up front or paying later for the consequences. So, in the United States right now, we spend 8% of our total income that we can spend on food, but we spend over 20% of our total income on care. We eat very cheaply, so we get sick. And then we pay for all these hospitalizations, but that doesn't solve the problem. It just eliminates it and keeps us alive. And if you buy bread at the grocery store, it probably has some additives in it because they like to add vegetable oils, trans fats and various chemicals like conditioners, emulsifiers and preservatives, and in particular potassium bromate, which is banned in many countries. So giving up bread for 30 days will have the added benefit of reducing toxicity. And the organs that will be very grateful are your liver and kidneys. Now let's delve a little deeper into the things that really confuse most people. For example, about the different types of bread. Some are considered bad and some are considered good. And a lot of people don't even realize that white bread and wheat bread are the same thing. They're just processed differently. They are not different types of grains. If wheat is white, it means it has been processed, brained, the germ has been removed, and only the inner part, called the endosperm, where the starch and gluten is. If you bake whole grain bread, you use whole grains and you grind everything. But what does that mean in terms of what we've been talking about, blood sugar, nutrients? Well, in terms of blood sugar levels, white and processed grains and whole grains are going to be about the same. I know you've heard differently, because they're trying to promote whole grains as healthy, but the difference between the two is about 1% that is so insignificant that they are really the same when it comes to nutrients. On the other hand, white grain is much worse. It is on par with processed sugar. It's white sugar, white flour, it's white trash. It's been processed and everything that can spoil has been removed from it. So processing removes the germ and the bran from it. And now you're deprived of minerals that you don't have. You're losing a lot of vitamins and fiber. But then we have to account for the anti-nutrients that interfere with nutrient absorption. And now the wheat is worse. But of course it doesn't matter much because the protein didn't have much nutrients anyway after processing. Then we move on to the effects of gluten and gluten. And they're about the same because all the gluten is in the middle, which you remove when you make white bread. In terms of allergies and lectins, the whole grain situation is actually much worse because most of the defense mechanisms of plant lectins are in the shell on the surface. And so if you eat whole grain, you're going to have more reasons for sensitivities, more reasons for allergies. But obviously when it comes to fiber, whole grains are better because they have almost no protein. I'm not a fan of white flour, white bread, because it's hardly better than white sugar. But when it comes to the real reasons why most people are better off avoiding bread other than glucose, which is about the same. The other important aspects are gluten reactions, allergies, and lectins. And when we look at those, they're either the same or worse for whole grains. So you really want to avoid white, but wheat can be even worse. But all of this so far has been about the modern hybrid wheat that most people get. But if you go out and look for ancient grains, how do they compare? Well, in terms of blood sugar, they're going to be much better because ancient grains had a lot more protein in them. Often they had two, two and a half times as much protein in them. The nutrients and anti-nutrients are probably similar to whole grains if you're eating whole grains, but in terms of celiac allergies and lectins, they're going to be much better because most of the gluten in modern grains has been specifically bred out every time. When they crossbred something, they had new types of gluten, and they tried to breed more gluten to get fluffy bread. And whenever people have a problem with modern wheat, they try some of the ancient gluten varieties. I'm not saying it's a free-for-all, but many people find that they have no problem with ancient grains, that they have no reaction, 
even if they can't tolerate regular bread. If you have a serious problem, sensitivity or celiac disease to regular wheat, you won't be able to tolerate ancient grains either. But if you're a little sensitive, ancient may be a better way for you and tolerated much better. Sometimes people say, I know I can't eat bread, but what if it's organic? Well, obviously it doesn't matter because all the factors we've talked about would be exactly the same. The only difference is that organic bread will probably have a little less chemicals and pesticides in it, but everything else will be the same. And then there's a very popular version of bread called Ezekiel bread. And is it really any different? Not really. Yes, because it's sprouted and very often old grains are used, not always, but sometimes. But when they are sprouted, some of the starch in them is broken down. Some of the nutrients are increased and there's less of some of the irritants. Some of the lectins are also broken down, but it's not. Most of these issues will still be present in them day and night. And for a certain percentage of people, giving up bread is almost impossible. Giving up the habit is so hard because it's like a drug. So what's going on here? It has to do with exorphins. You have all these chemicals in your body, like runners who get high on endorphin, a morphine-like compound produced internally. But if you add something from the outside, it has the same effect as exorphin. Externally, gluten breaks down into smaller pieces called polypeptides, and some of these have been called glutomorphins because they act like morphine. Penetrate the blood-brain barrier and bind to opiate receptors in the pleasure receptors in the brain. It seems a little strange, but consider this. If a heroin addict overdoses and goes to the emergency room, they are treated with an antidote called naloxone, which blocks the opiate receptors and the effects of the heroin drug so they can survive. But the same thing happens with glutomorphins. Naloxone also blocks the effects of glutomorphine, which means that these substances are very related. And here's how they tested it. They gave this drug to some people in a buffet with a lot of bread, and they ended up eating 33% fewer calories. So now they got really excited and thought we had the perfect weight loss drug and started feverishly looking for something to release to the mass market, but not so fast. Why does it work? Because it blocks the natural desire in the body. It blocks our reward pathway, which we don't have. Those receptors are not there by accident. They're there because we assume we have desires. We assume we have the urge to do something. And if we block that reward pathway, we also block the urge to seek reward. So the side effect of this drug is that it also suppresses mood, but I can only imagine that they would still want to put it on the market. And then they would have an instruction manual and it would say, first of all, make sure you take an anti-heroin drug with wheatgrass, but don't forget to take your antidepressant. And that's what usually happens in the medical model when they see something that they can influence. They come in and put pressure on it or block it, and then it causes an imbalance. And now they come in and try to influence it. And then they have to compensate for something else, and another, and another. And the only way the body is going to work in the long run is to create its own balance. So, what can happen if you give up bread for 30 days? Many people will experience withdrawal. But if you understand this and realize that the body is designed to find balance and recover very quickly, you will feel much better in just a few days. You will be calmer. Your mood will be more stable. There will be more focus and stability in your life. So I recommend that you just try it. Don't take my word for it. Give up bread for 30 days and then you will notice the changes. Better yet, write them down so they're really clear. And after 30 days, you can decide if you want to continue giving up bread or try to reintroduce it back into your diet. Chances are you'll have almost no cravings or desire for it. But if you do decide to try it again, try some of the old foods because they'll be much better for your digestive system. And another recommendation is to do it once in a while. Don't introduce bread into your diet first for a day, then three, top for a week, two. I think you get the principle. Immediately give up bread. Many people will be difficult, but gradually, quite possible. Well, my friends, I would be interested to hear your opinions and feedback on this. Share your personal stories with us in the comments. We believe that there are many different approaches to taking care of your own health. So people who don't include bread in their diet are more likely to lead a healthy lifestyle, unlike those who, for example, consume energy drinks and spend a lot of time playing video games. So if you share your experiences with us, please tell us about your overall approach to health and other details of your lifestyle so we can get a more complete picture. Since these people prefer more natural products, 
they are likely to be more active, be outdoors more often, and prefer high-quality products. So if you leave a comment, please mention these additional factors so we can better understand the context. More information on this topic, you'll find on our channel. Subscribe and turn on the bell of all notifications. Please, give us a like and watch these useful videos. We look forward to your comments.